tonight, we're going to be looking at a fresh and precious baptism of fire, a precious baptism of fire, because as we travel tonight to look at some passages, we're going to see just how precious it is. Listen, you cannot be on fire without being set ablaze by the fire of God. You cannot be on fire without the fire of God. Now, there's a lot of people who debate as to whether or not there is a baptism of fire. I was just watching a video yesterday and uh, they were speaking about the baptism of the f of fire like it was something that was unbiblical or uh, misinterpreted. And I'm going to show you tonight that it is not. I just think sometimes people try to force things onto something and they don't actually take time to really um, go a little bit deeper. In fact, let me begin right now before we get into it. We, we're going to, in just a minute, I'm going to say hello to everybody. I'm glad you're coming on. Be sure to say hello. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to show, I want to start with this passage here. I want to show you, this was John the Baptist. Let me see if I can pull this up so I can see it better. John the Baptist, of course, these words came from him in the beginning of his ministry. Or, um, well, maybe not in the beginning of his ministry. It might have been um, right in the middle. But in any case, he said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. And then he says this, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, the Holy Spirit and fire. Who would do this? Jesus. Jesus would be the one to do this. Now, some people say that it's the Holy Spirit and fire, meaning the Holy Spirit and judgment. So they say that the fire part is not for believers. The fire part is to judge unbelievers. The problem with that is it does not it does not say he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit or fire. It says he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire and fire. And let me show you the next passage. It says his winnowing fan is in his hand, speaking of Jesus, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So this is this is where the argument tends to come in. They believe that this is speaking of judgment. Well, I would propose that it is not speaking of judgment. It's actually talking about Jesus actually burning out of our lives the things that are not valuable, the invaluable things, not the invaluable, but you know, the things that are worthless, those things that are considered like chaff. But I also know this, that the same fire that brings judgment is also the fire that purifies. The same fire that brings judgment and ultimately will bring judgment in the world is the same fire that God uses to purify. It just depends on what side you are on in this equation. But for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, I can tell you this, and I'm going to show you from the scriptures tonight, that a baptism of fire is not only necessary, but it needs to be kept kindled in our lives because you cannot be on fire without being touched, without being ignited with the fire of God. And so this is what we're going after tonight. We are looking at a fresh baptism of fire. It's that it's that baptism of fire that that sets you apart to accomplish everything that God desires to accomplish in your life. Amen. So this is a study that is I believe going to be well worth our investment. So you can put some fire emojis in the chat tonight. Amen. <laughs> Let us know you're ready for a baptism of fire. We're ready for about, I've been crying out, Lord, I, I want to keep a, I want a fresh baptism of fire, Lord, a fresh baptism of fire. And I don't, I believe I'm not alone. I believe there's many of you who also want the same thing. Amen. Okay. So uh, just want to welcome you. I see that Mimi, of course, is with us tonight and she shared how her uh, father passed away and we just want to um, extend our prayers and, um, and just declare comfort, comfort, comfort over our sweet sister. I'm so thankful you got to spend some time with him that the Lord worked that out. What a precious family, what a precious daughter you have that was willing to support you in that and make that possible. 
and thankful that he is home with the Lord, that I know there's going to be some grieving you'll walk through. So we want to keep our sister held up in prayer for that. Um, welcome, Olive Tree. I'm glad you're here. And uh, Leilani, welcome. Lor Laurel, I think it's Laurel. Welcome. God bless you. And of course, Sister Lisa and Debbie Sue, who are here faithfully every week. Hey, I've got a special surprise for y'all tonight. I asked um, our moderators if they would be willing uh, to come and share a little bit, a little God story for God's glory. Amen. And so tonight we have the privilege of welcoming Adeline. She's going to be coming on towards the end of this evening. So I'm hoping you're all going to stick stick around and that way you can put a name with a face. So when you show up in the, in the chat on uh, these live streams and you see Adeline, you're going to remember her. You're going to remember her God story. I know God has put a sweet word in her heart to encourage us. Um, about the goodness of God. And so this week we have Adeline and I believe uh, next week, it's either Diana or Letty, you have to go back and look. But um, anyway, so I'm excited about that. And uh, that'll be towards the end um, of our time together this evening. But we got a good study ahead of us. Hey, I also want to make a couple of announcements too. Um, I'm going to mention this quickly tonight, but I'll be hitting on it in the next few weeks as we get closer to this date, but we do have a prayer rally that is coming on May 25th. Our ministry is going to do a prayer rally where we are bringing several churches together, pastors together um, in one location to hold up our community, our state, and our nation. Um, this is an important time to do that. If you want to find out more about that, you can go to our website. It is open to everybody. We also are going to provide lunch. Uh, so you guys can keep that in prayer. And if you are not local, you will be able, we are looking at a way that we can make that available via online. So you could always um, join this online if you desire to do that. But I just want to mention that right now. Like I said, we'll hit on it more as we get closer. Um, but keep your eyes open for that. And then um, I also want to mention, listen, every day, just about when I go and I try not to get online first thing in the morning. I try to, you know, wait until I've had time with the Lord and taking care of some things that I feel like the Lord wants me to. But every day I've been going, when I go online and check the comments, um, I'm seeing that somebody is in those comments as an imposter, somebody impersonating um, me with my picture. Maybe some of you have seen that. And usually they're asking in, in the uh, thing, they're asking for money for an orphanage, I think in Nigeria or something like that. Listen, that is fake. That is uh, not coming from us. It's not coming from me. I would never ask for money in exchange for a prophecy or a blessing in that way. I mean, we might ask, you know, people to sow into the ministry on occasion, but I'm not going to be hitting people up in the comments. Okay. So I just want people to be aware if you see that, you know, some people, I think they might even see it and, and be offended by it. I just want you to know it's not me. Okay. <laughs> so uh, ignore that. If you see it, report it. Um, because we want to, we want to, we want to cut those off. It's kind of like, um, you know, when they say somebody uh, puts graffiti on a wall, right? Like they say, the quicker you actually uh, cover that up, the better off you're going to be because there's almost like a little trophy in, in letting it stay there. So the quicker we can pull those down, the less likely I hope they're going to be to come back. So I just want to kind of let people know, you know, I'm praying people don't get taken advantage of by that, but um, sometimes you just never know, right? Okay, so we are going to open with a word of prayer. Um, I actually have a couple of words that Lord dropped in my heart for later too. I'm going to release those. Um, a couple words of knowledge for some of you. Um, and well, you know what? I'm going to mention them now, then I'll mention them again later. But what I'm going to do is we will drop in the chat later towards the end um, uh, a link where you can get prayed for. As always, we like to do that. So, you know, we, yes, we're going to have Adeline on, but we're also still going to have a time where we will release prayer for you if you desire it. But um, listen, when I was uh, praying earlier, the Holy Spirit dropped three things in my heart. The first one, and this may sound a little funny, but it's not going to be funny for the person who needs it. Okay. I saw the Lord actually show me somebody's big toe. Okay. So somebody has got something going on with their big toe that they need. Um, they need healing. Okay. And the Lord wants to heal you. He wants to heal you. And so that's why he releases a word of knowledge because he wants to release a prophetic word and his power 
into that in order to bring you the victory. So if that is you, and I'm mentioning it now, I will mention it again later. Um, if you are having something going on with your big toe, this is your opportunity to get that um, brought before the Lord. And we will pray over that tonight and release the power of God. I also um, heard from the Lord that there's, and this may be for one person or more than one person, um, there's somebody who's really struggling with a lot of confusion, like a double mindedness. Um, and what happens is, is when you are double minded, it opens the door for the enemy to come in and bring confusion. The Lord wants to bind that tonight and release you from that to get you back in a place of clarity and confidence before God. And then I also heard the Lord say there's somebody who's dealing with accusations and condemnation. It's just been, you just been heaped. You've been bombarded. You've been slammed with the voice of the enemy, just bringing accusations and condemnation. And the Lord wants to, to take that off of you tonight as well. So those are three, uh, what we call words of knowledge that the Lord is giving because he wants to do something about it, my friend. Okay. He wants to do something about it. So I will, I will, I will speak those again towards the end. So that way, when we bring Adeline on, you can be preparing to hopefully come on as well. And I'm just telling you, don't let anything hold you back. Okay. If you know, if you can't, if you're like, oh, I just can't be seen on camera, you know, we'll make allowances for that too. We, we would like to see you. So if you have audio and visual, we would like both of those. But if you can just go with the audio and get on, we, we want to encourage you to do that so that we can release this over you. And if you can't do either one of those, then just drop it in the chat. And, um, and we will, I'll, I'll try to catch those at the end, but it's always better if we can really, I mean, like specifically connect with you with those words. Okay. So I'm going to open with the word of prayer and, um, and bring us into the presence of God, because, uh, let me just tell you, uh, without him, we can do nothing. <laughs> okay. So we, we've got to bring this before the Lord together in Jesus name. And we need to let uh, the Holy Spirit have his way or else this is all for nothing. Okay. This is all for nothing. Okay. So, and uh, yeah, Pamela, I'll drop those three words back. You could go, you could scroll back a little bit if you wanted to on the video, but I will release those again towards the end. I need a Kleenex. I'm having kind of a, a little bit of an itchy nose tonight. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and go before the Lord. Ooh, so Letty, it might be your hubby, okay? And we can stand in faith for him together. Okay, Father, we thank you. Oh, God, we welcome. Holy Spirit, we welcome. Oh, Lord, we welcome your presence in our midst this evening or whatever time it is, Lord, in the different places that your people are. Um, I'm thankful for my brothers. I'm thankful for my sisters who are um, dialing in right now, Lord, who are um, opening up their hearts opening up their ears. And Lord, right now, I just speak to spiritual ears and I command you to be open in Jesus name, open in Jesus name. And I believe Lord tonight, you're about ready to move with your holy fire. Oh God. And so Lord, I know tonight you're ready to move on our behalf. You're ready to do a work, a deep work, a cleansing work, a purifying work, an empowering work in your people. Oh God. And so Lord, tonight we just dial in to what you want to do. We open our hearts, we open our ears, and Lord, I pray that all distractions are removed. I pray that your word goes forth in power, Lord, tonight, in Jesus' name. Let it be a spark tonight, God, as people are taking it in, whether it's on the live stream or afterwards, God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit moves in, in the way that only you can do, because your word says that you will do it, Lord. This is not something that we can make happen, it's something that you will do, God, and so Lord, we invite you to do it in our life. We invite you to do it in our life, God. And so Lord, tonight I follow your lead. I follow the trail of breadcrumbs that you've given me in your word. And Lord, just as just a simple instrument, God, I just release that word tonight over your people. And I look to you, God, to manifest your presence, to demonstrate your presence in our midst, oh God, as we are here in faith together tonight. And Lord, we do just stand in faith as well for our sweet sister Mimi and her, her loss but we know your gain, God. You've called her dad home to you, Lord. 
But Lord, in her grief, God, we pray that you be mighty, that you be a great comforter as you are, oh God, that you meet her in the secret place with, with you, God, that you comfort her in the night watches with you, God, and that the legacy, Lord, that her dad has, has left and those things that have been imparted to her, God, we pray that they would continue to bear fruit through her life and the lives of her children and grandchildren. And we ask all of this in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Okay. So you're going to want to, uh, get your Bibles ready. And, um, because I do have, uh, let me see here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, what I, so I put up a couple of passages when we first started, but I wasn't able to put all the passages up. Okay. So the Lord just kind of yesterday, I was sitting with the Lord and he just started weaving all these scriptures together for me. I've never taught on this before. Um, I mean, I've, you know, I've heard a little bit. I, I don't think you hear very much about the baptism of fire. At least I don't, that's not something that's not been part of my experience, but I believe it is for us and I believe we need it. And like I said earlier, you cannot be on fire unless you are experiencing the fire of God and the same fire that will bring judgment into the world is actually the same fire that God will use to purify. It just depends on what side of the equation you are on as to what kind of effect it's going to have. And I'm going to show you this from the scriptures tonight. Okay. So it was John the Baptist who made this statement, he said, he will, Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire and fire. It's not or fire, it's and fire. So when you receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, let me just tell you, you also receive a baptism of fire. But as we're going to see, even though you receive this, you've got to be responsible to maintain it. And there are subsequent baptisms of fire. Okay. And, and this will make more sense as we travel through this together um, in this session. Okay. So I want to begin by taking you to Acts chapter two, verses one through four. Let me see here. Acts chapter two, verses one through four, because this is where we actually see the fulfillment of this that John the Baptist talked about. And I want to make some connections for you that likely have not been made for many of you before, because I want you to see it, because I want you to hunger for this. I want you to desire this. I want you to open yourself up to it. And I'm telling you, even while I speak tonight, in the mighty name of Jesus, there are going to be those of you who will begin to experience this fire. Some of you, you're going to experience it physically. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Some of you are going to like literally begin to experience this fire physically. Now it won't, it won't hurt. I'm sorry. It won't harm you. Sometimes though, the fire does hurt. Okay. Because it's a purifying fire, but not like hurt, like in harm. It's, in fact, you, you, it's like a bittersweet kind of like, oh, Lord, take this from me. You know what I'm saying? When God does that deep work, you're like, take this thing from me, Lord. That's like that spirit of repentance comes on you. You're like, take this thing from me, God. And there's kind of a painfulness to it. But at the same time, there's such freedom. There's such liberty. There's such grace. And there's such goodness of God that's all over it. And let me just tell you, his baptism of fire is also a baptism of his love. Okay, because everything that God does, he does from his spirit as a spirit of love. God is love. So his baptism of fire also will fill you with the knowledge, with the with a quickening of his great love. Amen. Okay, so some of you will experience that tonight. Some of you, it's going to be more like a you might some of you might feel it physically. OK, some of you are going to begin to experience just a stirring, like a sparking up in your soul where maybe there's been a, a, a dimness. Remember, the Lord said, um, um, I think it's in Isaiah where it says uh, a, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoking flax he will not extinguish. What does he do? He blows on. 
he blows on it. He wants to ignite that fire in you again, my friend. Maybe it's felt dull. Maybe it's felt dimmed. Maybe you have felt burnt out. You know what I'm saying? The Lord wants to ignite that fire in you again. So for some of you, even while I'm speaking, as these words are going forth, here's what the Lord said. He says, they're going to spark. They're going to spark. They're going to, because there's already something burning in you, my friend. There's already something burning in you. And the Lord is going to spark on those words and you're going to begin to feel that fire being stirred up within you. And it's going to continue to burn and it's going to grow. Some of you, it's going to happen tomorrow. Like it's going to be the aftermath and you're just going to begin to have an increased hunger, an increased appetite for the things of God. Some of you where you have gotten a little bored with some certain things, God is going to bring new life on it. You see what I'm saying? So this is what God is about ready to do. He wants to baptize us in fire. Okay. So in Acts chapter two, beginning in verse one, here's the fulfillment of what John the Baptist said. Here's where it begins. It says this, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I'm telling you, there's power when the body of Christ is in one accord. Amen. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And then, now look at this, then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. Okay. And one sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, now listen. So what you see is that in this initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit, okay, because they were tearing for the Holy Spirit, right? The Lord told them, go and wait till you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they were there doing, they were doing what the Lord told them. They were there waiting. I want you to realize though, ever since this time, people don't have to wait. They don't have to go and tarry for days and weeks and months to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was already poured out. And when you were born again, you received the Holy Spirit. So now you just need to ask the Holy Spirit to fill you up. Okay. Now there's different measures of being filled. That's why we're to be filled and to keep on being filled. Just like there's different measures of the fire of God. We're to be set ablaze, but we're to keep on stoking those fires. And I want you to see that there were tongues of fire on their head. Now in this instance, with this particular initial outpouring, there were some distinctions to it that we don't see in subsequent time. Like for instance, it says that, that they heard. So there was like a physical um, audio, right? A audible manifestation of the spirit of God filling up. It says the whole place was filled up, right? It says, it says um, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house. Well, people who get baptized in the Holy Spirit don't, there's been some, you know, on a rare occasion, but most of the time people are not experiencing like this mighty rushing wind sound, right? And then it also says, and it filled the whole house where they were, and then there appeared divided tongues. So what I want you to realize what's happening is the Lord was giving a physical demonstration of what was happening in the spiritual realm for his people. OK, and this was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that he wants all of us to partake of as believers. Now, one of the manifestations is that you will speak in tongues and we're talking a heavenly prayer language. That's a topic for another time. If you are not convinced of that, I do have a teaching on that. You can go back and it's. Um, um, receive the gift of tongues today. It's in the live stream section. Receive the gift of tongues today. You can go back because I go through all the scriptures, I believe pretty much not all of them, but a number of them. Um, and so you can go through that if you need to. But I want to just, I want to make some connections here for us. Okay. Because here's what we have to understand is that this was a fulfillment of something that was even pictured under the old covenant. OK, it was pictured under the old covenant. So when um, when Moses was given the instructions to to build the tabernacle, so to speak, right, to it wasn't like a, a physical, like permanent building, but it was a tent structure. And he was given all of these heavenly instructions about the tabernacle. Right. And when he had completed it, 
when he had um, carried out everything according to what the Lord had said and everything, listen, everything had to be holy unto God. Everything had to be holy unto God. And once he had completed it, something happened. The tabernacle was baptized. The tabernacle of God was baptized when they consecrated that thing to the Lord. And so what did they do? We, we know one of the things that happened is there was a cloud that came over the tabernacle. And then it says his glory filled the tabernacle. Now, remember, the glory of God was not in the cloud. The glory of God filled the tabernacle. The cloud was just a physical manifestation so that they could see something with their actual eyes to see the presence of God in that space. Okay. Now, but they also had this. It wasn't just the glory of God that filled the temple. What else happened? They put the burnt offering onto the altar. And it says the fire of God came out of heaven and um, and consumed the offering. In fact, let me just read this to you. These I printed out so I wouldn't have to keep looking up all these verses. Um, it says this in Exodus 4. 40 verse 38. This is after they consecrated that temple. They, they did everything precisely, exactly according to the instruction of God. This is, this is what Jesus did for us, friends. He fulfilled the, all the requirements and then he himself became the sacrifice. Okay. And then it says, for the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and fire was over it by night. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's the wrong one. <laughs> okay. Leviticus 9.24. That's a, a different passage I'll maybe mention later. But uh, Leviticus 9.24, it says, fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When the people saw this, they shouted with joy and fell face down on the ground. What was happening? This was a baptism. This was a baptism of fire on that altar. And it ignited a fire in that altar that, listen, was to be kept going. It was to be kept going. I also want to read the same thing happened in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. This is when Solomon completed all the instructions to the very detail to, to build the temple for the Lord. And he, he fulfilled everything. And then when they consecrated that temple, what happened? The temple was baptized by what? By the spirit, by the presence of God, that the glory of God filled the temple. And there was a cloud. It was the exact same thing. A cloud covered it, but the glory of God filled it. And then in um, it says this in uh, 7, 1, 2 Chronicles 7, 1, when Solomon finished praying, fire flashed down from heaven and burned up the burnt offerings and sacrifices and the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple. It filled the temple. Okay. Then once this fire on the altar was lit in Leviticus chapter six, verse 13, it says, remember the fire must be kept burning on the altar at all times. It must never go out. So what do we see in Acts chapter two, when they received the fullness of the Holy Spirit, we, we have this Old Testament picture of the same thing. It's a baptism of being filled with the Holy Spirit. This is what, um, this is what John said, right? He said, what did he say? He says, uh, he says, uh, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we have an example in the Old Testament of when the tabernacle was consecrated, that temple was baptized, baptized with the presence of God. That's the filling of the, the Holy Spirit presence of God in the temple, but also the fire of God coming down and consuming the sacrifice. You see it with the, um, the tabernacle and the temple. And then he makes the same promise for the believers. He says, one's coming after me and he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. But this was not possible until Jesus finished the work on the cross, until all of our sins were atoned for, until he gave his life, rose from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the father and then poured out the Holy Spirit. Okay. And now everyone who is born again, receives the Holy Spirit and then can be filled with the Holy Spirit and also baptized in fire. And so on the day of Pentecost, there was a physical manifestation so that they would know, yeah, you've been baptized in fire. And what's interesting to me is they wouldn't have seen that flame. They would not have seen that flame on themselves, but they certainly would have saw it in one another. Come on. You can tell when somebody's on fire. Amen.
can tell when they're on fire because there's an excitement in their in their devotion to God. There's an excitement in their testimony about God. There's an excitement in their service to God. There's an excitement about their relationship with God. You can tell when somebody's on fire. You can also tell when they begin to dim. You can also tell when they begin to, what Jesus called, become lukewarm, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Okay, so it says, but listen, once this fire was lit, there was a responsibility to keep it burning, to continue to fuel that fire. That was part of under the old covenant. They were to keep that fire lit on the altar, but it is also true under the new covenant. We're to keep the fire lit on the altar of our hearts. Okay. And um, we'll talk about a couple of ways that we can do that, but let me just read this. Leviticus 1 7 says, the sons of Aaron, the priest shall put fire on the altar and lay the wood in order of the fire. And then, um, so in other words, it was their responsibility to keep the fire burning, the priests. Now you and I are priests unto God most high. And so you have a personal responsibility to fuel the fire. Now we don't cause the fire. The fire comes from the Lord, but we have a responsibility to keep the fire fueled. It's also one of the responsibilities of people who are called to minister to the body of Christ, to serve the body, because that's all a minister is. A, a minister is a servant of the body of Christ. Okay. And they're called to, one of their responsibilities is to keep fuel in the fire, okay, to keep fueling the fire in the people of God. So the people of God can stay on fire for the Lord. And we're going to see the value of this in just a moment. Okay. So I want you to see though, too. So we have the day of Pentecost. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. And um, you see a manifestation of these tongues of fire on their head, letting them know that now they have become the temple of the living God. Just like you and I, we now are the temple of the living God. We carry the very presence of God. And we have a very important responsibility to continue to fuel the fire of God in our lives. Amen. And one of the ways you're going to do that is with the word of God. You know, in Jeremiah chapter 23, he says that his word is like a fire. It also says it's like a hammer, but it's also like a fire. Hallelujah. Okay. His word is like a fire. And so when we release the word of God, okay. And we speak the word of God, we're meditating on the word of God. And you're listening to a message like this, that word is going to be part of what sparks that fire in us, feeds that fire in us, fuels that fire in us. This is how God designed it. So there's a part that the Lord plays in igniting that fire, but there's also a part that we play too. Amen. Now I want to take you to, um, let me see here. I want to take you to, uh, revelation chapter three. In fact, let me just look it up because I think I wanted to, uh, touch on this for just a minute. Okay. So in revelations chapter chapters, um, ch chapter two through three, he's writing right to these, uh, we always say the different, the letters to the churches, you know, technically, in fact, let me just read it here. Uh, let's see. This is Revelation chapter three, verse 14. And this is Jesus, right? Uh, John is on the Isle of Patmos and he has this vision and the Lord himself visits John while he's on the Isle of Patmos. Okay. And, um, and it says this, this is one of the letters that he was to write out to the churches, but it says this in verse 14 and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, right? And I wanted to, I want to stop right there for just a moment. This is kind of a bit, bit of a side note, but I think it's a good one. <laughs> okay. Um, some people say that when it says angel, it's actually talking about pastor. And I, I don't argue that, but I don't think it's complete. Because I want you to remember that every church, okay, every church where God has assigned a pastor, and I'm talking about a pastor that God has actually called into the ministry. Not all pastors are called into the ministries. There's some pastors that are out there, they're, they entered it, into it just as a profession, okay, and you'll know the difference. But when God has called somebody into the ministry, I want you to know that he also assigns an angel. He assigns an angel to, to help them carry out that ministry. 
Why is that important? I want you to know that just as as a just even a, um, a, a child of God, you are an ambassador of Jesus Christ. You also have a, a an angel assigned to you to help you to help you in life, to help you serve the Lord, to help you carry out the assignments of God. Just like a pastor has an angel to help him carry out the assignment of God. But you know what many believers do? They forget. They, they just totally are oblivious to the fact that God actually has angels that he has commissioned to help us carry out our assignments. Why do I say that? This is so important. And I say that because many times we just think that we're trying to handle things from just like right here in this little space. When God is saying, no, like I have a kingdom that I have activated to help you carry out the assignments and the mission I have for you. But you know what happens if we're not aware of that? We're, we're not going to be looking for the help. OK, you see what I'm saying? If you're not aware of it, then you're not going to be in faith and looking for the help. And therefore, you end up missing opportunities. That's just a side note I thought I would mention. OK, so it says in the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, Laodiceans, right? These things say the amen and the faithful and true witness. Hallelujah. That is Jesus. He's a faithful and true witness. And then it says, beginning of the creation of God, that's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Son of God, but also the Son of Man. But he also was there in the beginning. He is the second person of the Trinity. Amen. And nothing was created apart from him. Nothing. Okay. So then it says in verse 15, he says this, and he's saying this, he says to the angel of the church of the Laodicean. Why is it addressing the angel? I believe, yes, it's addressing the pastor. But remember, the angel is assigned to help him carry out that assignment. Okay, then he says this. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. Now, this seems so harsh. OK, but here's what the Lord is doing. He's saying, listen, you have exchanged. You have exchanged something. You have exchanged true wealth for that which is worthless. OK, he says like in other words, he's saying you think you've got it all together and you're handling everything and you're doing this, and you're doing that. He says in, in reality, you're actually wretched, poor, naked, blind. He, he names off all of these things. Why? Because they had exchanged. And this is what happens sometimes when people get just real comfortable where they are. They start exchanging the security that they get just from what they can do, what they can manage, what they can handle from their dependence upon the Lord. And I want you to recognize, he says, you, you're lukewarm. Now, this is such a scary place to be. He says, I would rather you be cold than lukewarm. Of course, he, he wants us all to be hot, but he says, I'd rather you even be cold. You know, when somebody's cold, at least you know, like how to deal with it. But you know, when somebody's lukewarm, they're just kind of like, um, they're just coasting. They go to church. Maybe they have their little Bible readings. Um, you know, they're like, well, I, I do all the right things. They check all the right boxes. They tithe and they pay their taxes, right? I mean, they're, they're like, well, I'm not doing anything wrong, you know, but listen, they're not hot. They're not passionate. They're not on fire for the things of God. They're just lukewarm. They're just coasting. They're just comfortable. They're not living in utter dependence, in a, in a heart of worship and glory in God. You know, the Lord, he is full of love and compassion and mercy, and he wants us to experience all that he has for us. But if we are just relying upon what we can do and our own abilities and our own comfortabilities just to protect that in life and just doing the bare minimum to get by, you know what happens? We end up being lukewarm. We end up, and he says that is disgusting. Like it's like it makes him want to gag and vomit. It's almost like um, it's like it's like people can become phony, right? Like these oftentimes are people who are living off of some historical event, account, uh, experience that they had with God. They're not like in the moment 
like walking this uh, this adventure with the Lord. And so he says, I would rather you be cold or hot. At least if you're cold, we know what to do with you, right? Like you need to wake up, you know? But if you're lukewarm, man, it's hard to shake people out of that because they're so convinced and they're just their own self-righteousness where I'm just doing the right things. I'm just coasting along, but they're not on fire for the Lord. And the Lord wants all of his children to be fiery ones. He wants every one of us to be on fire for him. Okay, now I want you to notice, he goes on to say this, verse 18. He says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Because one of the things about people who are lukewarm is they are spiritually blind many times. Uh, they're just dull to the things of the Holy Spirit. They're just they're just dull. Okay. So now let I want to share something with you because when he says this, I counsel you to buy gold refined in the fire, gold refined in the fire. It made me think of, um, let me see if I can find, where's that passage? Um, oh, did I write it down? Let's see if I wrote it down. Uh, where did I put it? Lord. Oh, Zechariah 13, nine. He says, I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. See one, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you four reasons or four results, you would say of this fire, this baptism of fire and why it's so powerful. Okay. But I, I want us to think about this, um, refined by fire. Okay. Refine them like silver and purify them like gold. Okay. You know, back in the, in the time of Christ, there was a lucrative business of uh, refining silver. So they would dig what we call ore out of the ground, right? Out of the earth or out of a mountain or whatever. And then they would take it. And somebody who was trained, like a trained smelter, had experience in this, right? They could look at a chunk of ore. Um, it's like a rock and they could see the streaks, the silver streaks, and, and they could recognize, Hey, there's value in this ore, but it also has other things in there. It has lead and it has uh, other minerals and stuff. And so they've got in order for it to, um, have the value of its potential, they've got to remove the impure from the pure, the pure being the silver. Now, some of you may be familiar with this process. Maybe you've heard of it before, but I still want to share it in connection with this baptism of fire, because I believe it helps bring understanding of why it's not just a one-time deal. It's ongoing. Okay. So the, so the smelter, what he would do is he would take that ore, and one of the things he would do is he would crush it down into smaller pieces. But then he would take a fire, <coughs> excuse me, and he would heat it up, okay? And you figure an average fire, at a campfire is about 200 degrees. But a smelter's fire uh, for the crucible needs to be at approximately 2,000 degrees, okay? That's not easy to achieve. You've got to have like a certain amount of coals and other things that you're, you're using to really fuel up, to really heat that thing up. So they take the ore and they put it into the crucible and they put the crucible once, once the smelters got it to the right temperature, he puts that crucible into the fire, right? And what happens is, is that silver, because it is denser and it, and it, um, it melts, um, um, at a lower temperature, it typically is what will melt first. OK, and as it does, the other impurities will rise to the surface and the smelter with his trained eye will then go and he will scoop off the impurities off the top. Now, one of the things that's interesting is once that smelter puts that ore into the crucible, he will not leave it. OK, he's like right there. He's on. He's not going and having a coffee break. You know, he's not going and getting a snack. He's like right there keeping his eye on this thing because he knows that he the whole thing could be ruined if he doesn't keep a close watch on it. So he's watching. And as soon as he begins to see those impurities rising, he's scooping those off. And the whole time he's keeping that fire going. And then listen, every so often what he will do then is he will look into that fire. He'll, I'm sorry, he'll look into that crucible, 
Okay. And what is he looking for? He's looking for his reflection. And at first his reflection is going to be very murky, but it slowly, little by little though, it will become clear and clear. And so what he does is he keeps this process going. He keeps the thing hot. He keeps bringing, he keeps removing the, um, the impurities off the top. And then now listen, at a certain point when he's got his reflection to a certain point, it's still not sharp. It's still not clear. It's still not pure, but it is pure than it was. So what he'll do is he'll remove that crucible from the fire and he'll let it cool down. And then what he does is he goes back to the fire and he heats it up even hotter. Okay. Even hotter. Now you would have thought the first few times that it would have brought out all the impurities, but it's not so. So he puts that crucible back on that fire that's even hotter this time around. And guess what happens? That as that thing begins to melt, more impurities begin to rise. Okay, more impurities begin to rise and he begins to scoop more off, scoop more off. And then eventually, here's what he's after. He's, he's looking to see a clear reflection of what? Of himself, of himself in that silver. That's what he's looking for, a clear, pure reflection. And once he arrived, once that, once that silver has gotten to that point and he looks down at that thing and what he sees is he it's not dull, it's sharp, it's clear and it's pure, then he's able to remove it from the fire. And he knows at this point, what was potentially valuable is now valuable. What was potentially valuable is now valuable. And that is, it's so, it's such refined silver that it can go anywhere. It's such refined silver that it can sit at a king's table and be used for the, in the finest. Okay. So this is, I, I want to mention this. Okay. Because the Lord is our refiner. Okay. And the fire, the, the baptism of fire does two things. Well, it does a few things, but one of the things it does is it will purify the impurities out of our life so that we can magnify, we can reflect the beauty of Jesus more purely, more completely, more fully. And this is a process. So sometimes we go through some stuff and God is using that stuff to refine us, to refine us. Now, I do believe the Lord he can do a couple of things. He can do it instantly. And I believe some, and many times he does, like he'll do something in us that will just shift something in us. It will heal something in us. It will, um, it will remove something from us. Like with a, it's like a power move that he'll release. Okay. And I believe he's going to do that for some people tonight, because sometimes there's something blocking. Sometimes there's something hindering. And the Lord says, you need refiner's fire. You need a baptism of fire to get that thing out of you. And so sometimes people misunderstand this and they don't realize that sometimes when people come under the power of God and they're like, whoa, it's hot, it's hot. I mean, like literally they'll feel a physical manifestation of the heat of God, okay? It's because he's doing this work in them, okay? People, you know, I was watching a video yesterday and um, there was this guy that I've I've seen a number of, of this man's videos um, where he, he moves very powerfully in the, in the anointing of the Lord. He's a very humble man, preaches the purity of Christ, uh, you know, crucified, risen son of God. I mean, you know, the whole thing in simplicity, but, but just a very humble man. And yet he moves very powerfully, um, in the anointing of God and people misunderstand. So this guy had took in one of his videos and all of these people in the comments were calling it a, a work of demons. Oh, look at it. It's so demonic. Cause these people had fallen on the floor and they're like, it's, they're like, I feel like I'm on fire. I feel like I'm on fire. Okay. God was not hurting them. It only lasted for a few moments, but God was doing something deep in them, deep in them. And many times the, the power of God would come and, um, and people would be like, like there would be like a, a surgery going on inside of them, like where a kidney was restored or a liver was restored. I mean, I literally saw one video where this lady, she had spent her whole life where her feet were clubbed like this. And um, she was in pain. She was like in her, I think her early forties, maybe late thirties. And she had spent her whole life just like with her club feet in like this. And it was caused her constant pain and it was growing worse and worse every year. And I watched in the, in this video, the power of God moved so powerfully, it straightened out her legs and her feet. And she walked for the first time in her life without pain. 
It was the power of God. And listen, this video, and I'm kind of going off on a little bit of a tangent, but this kind of stuff, these, some of these people who are doing these, what so-called exposed videos, they need to be exposed. Okay. Because they're, they're just doing surface level stuff. They have no understanding of what God is doing in these, in these, um, in these atmospheres. And so this, um, this guy he there's so much fruit, so much fruit. And isn't that what the Lord said? You'll know them by their fruit. People who again and again and again have testified of what God did in one of those meetings and months and years later are saying it transformed me. I was healed. I was delivered. I was, you know, I, 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 I had something major wrong with me and they were, you know, totally healed. And so we have to, I point this out because sometimes the power of God can bring an instantaneous, an instantaneous uh, igniting a holy fire that will burn through somebody to purify, to sanctify, to set apart, and sometimes to deliver them because sometimes the fire of God will deliver people from demonic, um, uh, a demonic oppression or demonic um, strongholds in their life. They need the fire of God. And remember, Jesus is the baptizer and Jesus is the one who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire and fire. So I point that out. There's times where it's instantaneous, but there's other times where it's a process. There's other times it's a process because some, and, and I believe God will use both of these if we're open to it. Okay. So sometimes, cause remember Jesus, when he uh, got filled with the Holy spirit, at the, uh, the Jordan, he was baptized by John the Baptist. He comes out of the water and it says the Holy Spirit came on him like a dove. And then it says he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. It says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. But after being tempted by the enemy for 40 days and 40 nights, you could call that a type of fire that he was walking through. It says he came out of that experience full of the power of God full of the power of God. And we have to understand that sometimes God allows us to go through things to refine us, I'm not saying that Jesus had sin that needed to be dealt with, but there's still something about that, that those fiery times, those fiery trials that we walk through that have a purifying effect on our faith and, and cause us to be released in a new level of power. And I want to mention this because I know there's some of you right now, you've been going through a fiery trial of your faith. And if, if you can ask the Lord, Lord, show me, cause I want to, I want to glean everything I can out of this fiery trial so that as I come out, Lord, I come out strong in you. I come out mighty in you. I come out with a new level of authority, a new level of power in you, God, a new level of might in you. We also know with a Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego right? They were, they were thrown into the fiery furnace and what happened? Their bands were loosed. We know the fire of God can loose our bands. Now we know God didn't cause that particular fire, but it's a picture of some of the things God will allow us to walk through for our good, for our good. So we can be filled with more of him and less of the things of the world. Amen. Okay. So I want to, um, let me go over this. Let me see here. I want to name four things very quickly. Okay. I want to name four things that the fire of God will do. The fire of God will do. Number one is it will pure, it will purify. Okay. It will purify. It brings purity. I already mentioned Zechariah 13 verse nine. It says, I will bring that group through the fire and make them pure. I will refine them like silver and purify them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, these are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Just like that refiner, that smelter. He's looking for his reflection. He wants people to see him in us. And that fire can, can bring that about. That fire can, can purge or purify our lives of the things that are worthless, the things that are contaminating, the things that are spoiling, the things that are defiling, the things that are watering down the spirit of God, if you know what I mean. God wants purity because purity brings power, my friend. Purity brings power in the Lord. Okay, the next one is the presence of God. The fire of God actually brings us into the presence of God. This is, you know, the Lord is called an all-consuming fire, an all-consuming fire. And you cannot approach 
the throne of God without passing through fire. Okay. In, um, in uh, Revelation 4, 5, it says from the throne proceeded, this is a revelation, right? That John was having of the throne of the throne room of God. It says from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And then it says this, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Okay, now there's not technically seven spirits, but there's seven there's seven um, workings of the Holy Spirit as as talked about in Isaiah chapter eleven. Okay, but all of this has to do with fire, fire. Okay, and fire brings purity. Fire brings refinement, but it also can ignite your heart with a passion for the presence of God. You cannot get close to God without passing through fire. You cannot. In fact, the uh, angels, the seraphim that tend to the Lord that are talked about in Isaiah chapter six, the word Sarah, seraph, I think it's seraph. It means burning. They're burning ones. They're fiery ones. Why? Because they tend right there in the presence of God. And did you know that angels that come from the presence of God, they're going to come carrying fire. They're going to come carrying fire. That's like one of them carried a coal from the altar to purify the mouth of Isaiah so that he could go forth. Now we know Jesus became the living sacrifice that was pleasing. He was a pleasing aroma unto God. But now we're told, and I want to read this to you um, in Romans chapter 12, that we're to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. Did I say living sacrifice? Jesus was like, uh, in a sense, like the burnt offering before God right? He gave himself up unto death before God. And he was a sweet aroma unto God. And he did that for us so that we could be made acceptable to God. But we're still called to become a living sacrifice, which is equatable to the burnt offering that was consumed by the fire, okay? Consumed by the fire of God under the old covenant. But I want you to, okay, so the first one is pure purity. The next one is presence. The fire of God will, will bring you closer and cause you to, to draw near to God, like to have your heart melded with his. That fire of God will do that because many times we struggle in intimacy with God because there's too much of us in the way, friends. There's too much of us in the way. And so that fire can remove us out of the way so that we can experience a more complete intimacy with God. Okay. But it also will clarify your purpose. Okay. So in Romans chapter 12, let me go back and read this to us really quick. In Romans chapter 12, um, uh, let me read this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may, now listen to this, that you may prove. Another version would say that you may know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The fire of God has the ability to refine you in a way that will bring clarity to your purpose. Instead of you being in confusion, it brings clarity to your purpose. Many times people are in confusion because they're trying to hang on to their own agenda, their own will, and the will of God. So they're like, how can I make these two work together? And they end up in confusion. And so many times when we just surrender and we let the fire of God burn away those other things, then God brings clarity. And let me tell you, his plan is the best plan. Okay. His plans are good. He, he knows the plans he has for you to prosper you, not to harm you. There is nobody who has a better agenda, nobody who has um, a, a, a better, um, what would you call it? Um, mix, no, he has no mixed motives in his heart for us. Nothing but good is what he desires. So that's really, his desire for us is, is I mean, like our desire for ourselves is nothing compared to his desire for us. We're far better off just submitting and surrendering completely to him and presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. Amen. And every time I get in confusion, this is what I go back to. 
this is what I go back to. I remember, Lord, it it all belongs to you. I want nothing but your will. Burn away out of me, God, anything that is not of you so that I am wholly aligned with your agenda and your will. And you know what happens? Clarity comes. Clarity comes. Clarity of purpose. Clarity of intent. It comes. Okay. And then the last one I want to mention is power. Power. The result of the baptism of fire is that you are going to walk in greater dimensions of the power of God. How can you not? Um, remember I said um, the Isaiah chapter 11, it gives us the uh, the, the so-called seven spirits of God, right? There's just seven dimensions or seven different aspects of how the Holy Spirit works. We want to be filled with him. But did you know you can't be filled with with him, if you're filled with other things. So part of the fire of God increases our capacity to carry the presence of God. And the more you have of him, the more you have of his power. It says the spirit of the Lord. Uh, let me see. Did I write that one down? The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now, might specifically is power. But listen, all of this, knowledge is power. Wisdom is power. We're talking about of God. Okay, There's, there are certain situations where you need a breakthrough. The power of God is going to manifest you as wisdom from God. There are certain situations you need a breakthrough. The power of God is going to manifest as some kind of knowledge that you need, some knowing that you need. Some of you, the, the the breakthrough is on the other side of the fear of the Lord. So you need that. And it's not like a fear, like I'm cowering in a corner. It's just a holy reverence that God knows there's nothing too difficult for him. There's nothing too hard for him. There's nothing hidden from him. There's no angle that hasn't already been seen by him in this. There's nothing from his that's hidden from his sight. So that fear of the Lord sometimes is the key that I need to my breakthrough. You see what I'm saying? So the fire of God has this incredible ability to burn off the useless, the worthless, and cause us to be a, a greater reflection of him, but also to carry a greater capacity for his presence and his power in our lives. So it's a beautiful thing. And so I want to release tonight this, um, this fire through the word of God. I'm just going to pray that. I'm going to release it. And like I said, some of you, you will feel it. You're going to feel it like right now. Okay. Others of you, it's going to, it's going to be like a little sneak attack. Okay. Because I'm telling you, we cannot release this word and you have an open heart to it an open ear to it. And the Holy spirit not move in that way. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. You can anticipate it. It'll either happen right now or it's going to come very quickly in the next few days. Okay. So I'm going to close in a prayer. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to pray over you for that. And then um, Adeline is going to come on in just a moment. We also are going to drop a link in the chat. So if you need prayer tonight, we want to make sure you have an opportunity to do that. And let me just re let me give you these words again before I close this in prayer and I release this fire, the fire of God, okay, the fire of God to burn off that dross, to burn off that flesh. Hmm? Before I do that, um, I want to mention I had three words that the Lord dropped in my heart. One is somebody's got a big toe and they need healing in their big toe. And it looked like Letty said her husband has a big toe. So we're going to stand in faith for that. But if there's somebody else, we want to make sure you come on and um, we'll pray over that because God, God is bringing this out. It's a word of knowledge because he wants to heal it. Okay. The second thing I had was double mindedness. Somebody has been plagued with double mindedness, confusion. They've been back and forth, back and forth. And God wants to really, he wants to remove that double mindedness. He wants to remove that confusion because it's an open door to the enemy to just mess with you and wear you out. So we want to get that broken. If that is you, we want to invite you to come on and um, hit that prayer link. Uh, Adeline dropped it in the chat for us. And so you can hit that and then we'll bring you on. Okay. Um, you might need to wait just a few, you know, just a little bit while we uh, get there. But um, the next one is 
If you have been experiencing accusations and condemnation, bombarded, you know, just where the enemy just keeps coming and you keep getting hit, right? You keep getting hit, you keep getting hit by accusations and condemnation. The Lord wants to break that tonight. So we would invite you to come on for prayer. Okay. Okay. So um, let me release this prayer over you guys for the fire of God. We want to make sure to do that. And then I'm going to bring on Adeline. And then for those of you, if you are one of these people, we want to invite you to come on in prayer. Or if you have another prayer need, you're welcome to do that too. Okay. Hey, we have somebody in the chat. Uh, gold refined through fire. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. So let's stand in faith together. Father, we bring ourselves before you. Oh God, I thank you for this promise that we could be baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire and fire. And so right now, Lord, according to your word and the quickening of your Holy Spirit, I just release fire in Jesus name fire in Jesus, a baptism, a fresh baptism of fire in Jesus name. I thank you, Lord, that a bruised reed you will not cast out, that a smoking flax you will not extinguish. But Lord, you are looking to breathe upon us, to release a fresh fire in us, to burn away the dross and to, and to purify and, and to get rid of false idols and anything that would stand in the way of a heart that is fully devoted to you. And Lord, I believe tonight you are right now in this moment, releasing your fire, oh God, to ignite a fresh passion in your people, a renewed passion, oh God, that will bring clarified purpose, that will bring a greater presence and bring us into a greater revelation of your presence that is abiding with us at all times and a greater purity and power, God, for us to walk in these times and in these days. And so, Lord, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for the baptism of fire. And I just quicken that now in Jesus' name. Fire, fire, fire. In Jesus' precious name. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise.